Okay, so in this video, we're going to review the 2019 IGCSE multiple choice paper uh, from the summer. So uh, let's start off with question one. So which quantity can be measured directly using a micrometer screw gauge? So there's a few things to pick up here. So first of all, what is a micrometer screw gauge? That's this tool that you should have used as part of your uh, lessons preparing you for GCSE. It's one of the tools you have to know how to use. Uh, and the other thing to pick up is that it says measure directly. And what that means is you're not going to be doing any subsequent calculations. You should be able to measure this thing directly using the tool, not having then calculate the stuff. So a micrometer measures length. So we're not going to be able to measure area because we would have to measure two lengths and do a calculation to do that. We're not going to measure mass because it measures length. So that doesn't make any sense. Uh, the thickness of a sheet of paper, yes, that would work. We use it for measuring things like thicknesses of wires, thickness of paper, that kind of thing. That makes sense. Volume of sheet of paper, uh, again, you're going to have to take three measurements and multiply them to do that. So that's not a direct measurement. Okay, question two, the velocity of an object increases from 30 meters per second to 50 meters per second in five seconds. What is the average acceleration of the object? So the equation to calculate ex average acceleration is this one you can see here. It's the change in velocity divided by the time in which that change occurs. I'm using the symbol V for final velocity, U for initial velocity. Uh, so then we're doing final minus initial, which is how we calculate a change plug those numbers in and we get four meters per second squared. So that's option C. A heavy metal ball falls vertically downwards through the air past four equally spaced levels, J, K, L, and M. So well, we can see those. The times taken to fall from one level to the next are measured. So we measure the time to go from J to K, K to L, L to M. Where, this, where is the speed of the ball greatest and which time is shortest? Well, those two are going to go together because when it's going to when it's traveling the fastest, it will have the shortest time. So it will be the same transition. So it's got to be one of our rows of our table which shows the same. Okay, so that's going to be useful. So the shortest time is going to be where it's fastest and it's going to be fastest here because it's had the longest to accelerate by this point here. So we can see that it is option D, which matches our criteria from earlier. We've got the same answer for both. So a body is moved from place X to place Y, where the gravitational field strength is different. What happens to its mass and to its weight due to the move? So let's first define what those two things are so we can see which one will change and which one won't. So mass is the quantity of matter inside an object. So it's essentially how many atoms it's made from fundamentally. So if you take x some place from place x to y, we haven't changed the number of atoms or anything that's inside it, so we haven't changed its mass. Whereas weight is the force experienced by a mass when it's in another mass's gravitational field. And we often calculate it using this equation here. So if we have a mass of one kilogram times it by the gravitational field strength, that would give us the weight. So we, if we look in here, we can eliminate A and B straight away because it says that mass changes, which is just wildly wrong. Uh, C and D both say mass stays the same, so that works. Uh, the, the weight is going to change because if your gravitational field strength, or this G, changes, then that's going to change the weight. So we need option C. Okay, so the diagrams show four solid blocks with their dimensions and masses. Which block has the greatest density? Well, density is mass divided by volume. So what I've done down here on the left is I've calculated the density of each of these blocks in grams per centimeter cubed. As long as they're all in the same unit, it doesn't particularly matter which unit we're doing it in. And you can see down here that the uh, density three, which corresponds to C, is the one that is the largest there. So that's how we select our answer. A student wishes to determine the spring constant of a spring where it obeys Hooke's law. Um, so in terms of what that means, if we plot the force against extension, if it's obeying Hooke's law, it's going to be a straight line through the origin because Hooke's law says they're directly proportional up to the limit of proportionality. 
Okay, so different loads are hung from the spring and its length is measured for each different load. And we've got the weight that we've hung on it and the length of the spring. So that's the first key to thing to pick up here. We've been given the length of the spring, not the extension. So that's what we're going to deal with first of all. So the tension force in a spring is calculated using the spring constant and the extension. So I'm going to add essentially a row to the table with extension in it. So its original length we can see is 12. So it's got an extension of zero uh, initially. And we're going to subtract 12 from each of our values. That actually gives us the extension. And then we can do the force we've applied divided by the extension. So I've picked this uh, first one with two newtons and an extension of eight. And that will give us a spring constant. That's actually, I need to make a slight correction. That's actually newtons per centimeter because I've got the extension in centimeters there. Um, and I, I guess if I was being correct, I should have had that unit there too. And we can see that is option D. Okie dokes. So we've got a mass of 20 kilograms held stationary by a rope passing over a frictionless pulley. So we can see the tension from the rope is what's supporting this 20 kilogram mass. What is the tension? Well, the fact it's stationary tells us that tension and the weight force must be equal to one another. So that means tension is going to be the weight force of the object, which is just 20 times 10, 200 newtons there. So a boat starts moving across a river at velocity v perpendicular to the riverbank. The boat encounters a current along the river of velocity u. As shown. Which vector diagram shows the resultant velocity r of the boat? So the, what we had to, when we're adding vectors, the, what we have to do is we had to add them tip to tail. And the resultant goes from start to finish. So if you look over here on the right hand side, I've put u first and then v. We could have done them the other way around. It would make no difference. And then I've drawn the resultant from the start of u to the end of v. That's what we mean when we say start to finish. And when we say tip to tail, it means you draw one and then you draw the other one at the end of it, like you can see in here. So we're looking for a diagram that looks like this. Um, so we can see that it's not a because we haven't got them tip to tail here. Uh, it's not B, because again, they aren't tip to tail. It is C, because we've got them tip to tail, and then the resultant from start to finish. And then D, we've got them tip to tail, but the resultant goes from finish to start, so the resultant's in the wrong direction. A ball of mass 0.5 kilograms falls and hits the floor at 10 meters per second. It rebounds at a speed of 8 meters per second, as shown. Okay. The collision between the ball and the floor lasts for 0.5 seconds. What is the average force acting on the ball during the collision? So, first thing is I'm going to do some defining. So I'm going to define upward as positive and downwards as negative, and that's going to be important in a second. So because this one has a velocity of 10 meters per second downwards, that's going to be minus 10. This one is 8 meters per second upwards, so it's going to be plus 8. So we have two different ways of calculating impulse. So we should know that impulse or change in momentum is force times time. And we should know that impulse is the change in momentum. I don't know where my V's gone there. Let's just quickly add that in. And change in momentum, the mass of the ball has stayed the same. So we can express it as M, its final velocity minus its initial velocity. We want to calculate the force, so I'm going to put those two equations together. So I've made those, I've essentially made these two parts equal to one another, and I've rearranged to make force the subject. So force is the change in momentum over time, or the rate of change in momentum. Plug our numbers in, and this is where it's important to get our signs right. So we do final velocity, which is plus 8, minus minus 10, that was its initial velocity, and then we can get what our force is. The 0.5 cancelled out and made this a lot easier. So we get plus 18, which means it's 18 upwards. An object falls from the top of a building that is 25 metres high. Air resistance is negligible. What is the speed of the object when it hits the ground? So um, because air resistance is negligible, 
what I'm going to do is use this model here. So the GPE that it loses must be equal to the kinetic energy that it gains. This is what this expression is saying. So we're applying conservation of energy here. So we're starting with, so we're gonna essentially gonna lose the amount of GP corresponding to 25 meters. So we can, first of all, cancel out our masses because it's the same on both sides. We're gonna rearrange to make the speed of the object the subject in here. Then we can plug our numbers in to this expression and we get it's 22 meters per second. So we solved that using conservation of energy. GPE lost is kinetic energy gained. That's the key part there. So 11, machine is very efficient. What does this mean? Well, efficiency is about uh, not wasting energy, essentially. So let's see which answer corresponds to that. Large amount of power. No, that's not efficiency. Uses very little energy. No, that's not right. Wastes very little energy. Yes, that's efficiency. Works very quickly. Again, no, that's not what efficiency is all about. A crane takes two minutes to lift a load to the top of a building. The change in gravitational potential energy of the load is 360 kilojoules. So the thing I'm going to pay very close attention to is the units that we've got. So we've got minutes and we've got kilojoules. So we're going to have to make some conversions in there. So we want to calculate power. So average power is the work done per second. We've done work to increase the GP, so the work has been done to do that. And we've been given what the change in gravitational potential energy is. It's 360 kilojoules, so it's 360,000. Two minutes, so that's 120 seconds. And then we put that in, it comes out as 3,000 watts or 3 kilowatts. Again, paying attention to our units in our answer. The diagram shows a stone suspended on a string under the surface of a liquid. The stone experiences a pressure caused by the liquid. What would increase the pressure on the stone? So when we're dealing with liquids, the way equation we have for figuring out the pressure is pressure is going to be the density of the liquid multiplied by the gravitational field strength multiplied by the depth below the surface. So these are the three factors which can change the pressure on the stone. So we can get rid of A and B straight away because they're not in the equation. So they're not going to be in, have an impact here. If they did, they would be in the equation. Lowering the stone deeper into the liquid, that would mean they're going deeper. Uh, so that looks correct because we're essentially increasing the H in the equation. If we have a lower density, we've decreased this rho term here. That would give you a lower pressure. So it would change it, but it would have the wrong change. We're not looking for that. A stationary smoke particle is hit by a fast moving nitrogen molecule. Which row describes the motion of the smoke particle and of the nitrogen molecule after the collision? So the, the key thing here is that the smoke particle is much more massive than the nitrogen particle is. Um, that's why we can see the smoke particle, but we can't see a nitrogen molecule. The smoke particle is much, much bigger. OK, so. Um, if the smoke mass is much greater than nitrogen mass, what's going to happen is the nitrogen is going to rebound. And that's a law that works all the time. If you have something really small colliding with something really big, the small thing will just bounce off and the smoke or the large thing will have a slight movement, but it won't be very big. Okay. So we are going to have a force applied to the smoke. So the smoke is going to change its motion a little bit, but the nitrogen is going to bounce off it. So let's have a look at which answers fits with that. Well, we've got the, we're looking, we, it had to be either A or C because the nitrogen is going to rebound. And then the smoke particle has to move a little bit in order to conserve momentum. So we're going to get a slight, slight movement of our smoke particle. A night storage heater contains a large block of material that is heated electrically during the night. During the day, the block cools down, releasing thermal energy into the room. Which thermal capacity and which nighttime temperature increase would cause the most energy to be stored by the block? So let's get our equation that we use here. So the energy it takes to heat up something is equal to thermal capacity. That's those two lumped together times by the temperature change. So if we want to store more energy, we need a bigger thermal capacity or a bigger 
temperature change. So let's see which of our answers corresponds to that. Um, well, we can get rid of C and D straight away because small heat capacity is small amount of energy stored. And then we can see it's option A because we want a large temperature change as well. So 100 grams of water at 25 degrees C are poured into an insulating cup. 50 grams of ice at 0 degrees C is added to the water. The water is stirred until the temperature of the water has fallen to 0. So we're essentially causing the water to go from 25 to 0. So we must be removing energy from the water. 18 grams of ice remains unmelted. The specific heat capacity of water is 4.2 joules per gram per degree C. Which value does this experiment give for the specific latent heat of fusion of ice? So this is actually a multi-step question, so let's see how this works. So the first thing I'm going to do is work out how much energy must have been removed from the water. So we've got specific heat capacity of water in joules per gram, so we're going to multiply it by the number of grams and also by its temperature change. So it's gone from 25 to 0, so that's why we put 25 in there. And we can see that the water, the liquid water, has lost 10,500 joules of energy in order to cool it down to zero degrees, which means the ice must have gained 10,500, assuming we haven't exchanged any energy with the surroundings. Okay, So that's our first stage there. Ice has gained 10,500 joules of energy. The ice is going to be melting, so it's undergoing a state change, which tells us we should be using this equation. We want the specific latent heat of fusion, so we're going to make L the subject. So we know it's gained 10,500 joules of energy, and we know that 50 minus 18 grams of water has changed state. So that gives us the specific latent heat of fusion in joules per gram. So we can see that when we round that, that's option. B. In which does thermal conduction not occur? So conduction relies on particles. Okay, so that's going to be the key to answer this question. That's going to mean it doesn't happen in a vacuum because that's the only one of the options that doesn't contain particles. Whereas conduction, you need particle to particle collisions. The metal surface of a kettle is hot. What happens to the cool air outside the kettle when it comes into contact with the hot kettle? So essentially what's going to happen is the air is going to warm up. And you should know that when something warms up or its temperature rises, it expands or its volume increases. And if the volume increases, that's going to mean the density decreases. So we're looking for one that says density of the air decreases. The other thing that happens is as your air expands, it's now less dense than all the surrounding air, so it's going to accelerate upwards, which you might describe as rising. So we're looking for one that says the density decreases, and that means it's going to have an upthrust thrust, which is going to make it float in the air, essentially. So let's have a look at that. Um, so we're looking for the two correct statements here. So the first two I've got the density decreases, uh, but only B says the air rises as well. These other two give the wrong conclusion about density, so we're, we're confident our answer is B there. Some hot water is sealed inside a metal can. The can is in a vacuum on outer space. The hot water slowly cools down. How does the thermal energy escape into space? Well, the first thing that's got to happen is the energy has got to move from the water into the metal can. And that's going to be transferring from a liquid to a solid, so that's going to be a process of conduction. Okay, And then to go from the can into space, we're going to have to be radiation because there's no particles in space, so we need the heat transfer method that doesn't have particles. So that's radiation. So that's how we end up this one. So we've got conduction and then radiation. When water waves pass through a gap, they diffract. The diagrams show wave fronts approaching a narrow gap. In which diagram will the, le will the diffraction be the least? Okay, so essentially, to get no or very little diffraction, the gap has to be much bigger than the wavelength. And the only scenario where the gap is much bigger than the wavelength is option C. 
A and B, it's smaller than the wavelength, and D, it's about the same size as the wavelength. All three of those would cause a reasonable amount of diffraction. It's only when the gap is much bigger than the wavelength that we get very little diffraction. An object is placed 30 centimeters in front of a plane mirror, which statement describes the image of the object. So the factual knowledge you're expected to have in answering this question is knowing that mirror images are the same size as the object, they're the same distance from the mirror as the object, they're laterally inverted and they are virtual. So we'll need some of that information here. So let's look through our options. So it says the image is the same size. Good. It said it's 30 centimeters from the object. No, it will be 30 centimeters from the mirror, which would make it 60 centimeters from the object. Um, so you can see here, I've done a little sketch. If our object is 30 centimeters from the mirror and the image is 30 centimeters from the mirror, the, the total distance between them is 60 centimeters. That's why it's option B. A small object is placed near a converging lens as shown. The lens forms an image I. Which statement is correct? So we've got the image is diminished. Diminished just is the opposite of magnified, so it just means it gets smaller. Image is inverted, so it's actually upside down. Image is real. What that means is light rays actually pass through the image, and the object is closer to the lens than its principal focus. Okay, so that's just described anyway. So let's have a look at our two different conditions with converging lenses so we can start to see how we answer this question. So we can answer straight away that C is wrong because we can see that no rays actually pass through where the image is formed. So we can get rid of C straight away. The other ones we're going to need to think a bit more about. So here are our two conditions. We've got an object outside the focal point or outside the principal focus. So we can see on the top diagram, it's to the left of the principal focus. And on the bottom one, the object is inside the principal focus of the lens there. So if the object is outside the principal focus, you get an inverted image on here over here on the right side. And we get a real image because we can see the lens go through. So we know already it's not that one because the one we looked at previously was an, a virtual image. So we know it's not going to be inverted. And we, so we know basically, we know it's not this one. We know the object isn't beyond the principal focus. If you look at the bottom one, it says uh, if we're inside the principal focus, it's, it's magnified. Okay, so we, then we can say it's virtual, which is matches with what we've seen, and it's upright. Okay, so that so this is the information I'm using. So what I know now is it's not beyond the principal focus. It's we know it's virtual. We know it's going to be magnified, so it's not diminished, and we know it's not inverted. Back to our question. Uh, we now know it's inside the focal length, so we know it's not diminished. We know it's outside the focal length, so we know it's upright, so it's not inverted. So it must be that the object is closer to the lens than the principal focus. So there's a lot of stages of logic to go through there, um, but that's how we answer this question. An eclipse of the sun happens when the moon comes between the earth and the sun. Which statement is correct? It says infrared, infrared radiation disappears before visible and ultraviolet. Ultraviolet disappears before visible infrared. Visible disappears before ultraviolet infrared. They all disappear at the same time. Well, they're all being produced by the sun. So there are, they're either getting through or they're not, depending on whether the sun's blocked or not. So it's going to be option D here and fairly straightforward. A pulse of sound is produced at the bottom of a boat. The sound travels through the water and is reflected from the shoal of fish. The sound reaches the boat again after 1.2 seconds. The speed of sound in the water is 1500 meters per second. How far below the bottom of the boat is the shoal of fish? So I'm going to use the average speed is distance over time. So distance is average speed times by time gives us 1800 meters. But we have to remember that the signal has gone to the bottom and gone up to the top. So 1800 is the distance to the bottom and then back to the top. So we have to halve that to get the, the distance 900. What is the approximate value for the speed of sound in air? It's about 330, 340. That's just something you have to know. 
Uh, option D is the speed of light in a vacuum. The other ones, I don't know what they are. Why is soft iron used in the core of an electromagnet? So, uh, soft iron easily becomes a permanent. It's not true. It, uh, it soft means it will it wouldn't be using a permanent magnet. We need hard materials to be a permanent magnet. Soft iron is a good conductor. Has nothing to do with magnetism. So. Again, that's not correct. Uh, soft iron is more thermal conductor. Thermal conduction has nothing to do with electromagnetism, so it's not that one. Soft iron loses magnetism when the current in the coil is switched off. Yes, that's what we want. We want our electromagnet to be on when there's a current and off when there isn't a current. And we want it to quickly change between those two so we can control it effectively. So that way, that makes sense. So diagram one shows two thin uncharged strips of plastic. Diagram two shows the same chip strips after they've been rubbed with a dry cloth. Okay, which row describes the charge on the strips after rubbing and the force between the strips? So we can clearly see those two are repelling each other. So they must be the same charge because they're pushing each other away. So the one we're looking for is the same charge, so we can get rid of options A and B straight away. And we can see they're repelling, so we can see it's option D. A cell has an electromotive force of 1.5 volts. What does this statement mean? Well, I'm going to use an equation to help us understand this. So the equation you should know, E equals QV, or V equals E over Q. So what does this mean? It means that the EMF is the energy required per unit of or per coulomb of charge so it says unit of charge per one coulomb of charge so let's see which answer matches that up uh, that's option b because you can see it's 1.5 joules per one coulomb which two changes to a metal wire both increase its resistance so let's step out for a second and think of the factors that can change the resistance of a wire if you increase the temperature of a wire that makes resistance go up if you increase the length of the wire, that makes resistance go up. If you increase the area, cross-sectional area of a wire, that makes resistance go down. So if you increase the radius or the thickness of the wire, that makes resistance go down. So let's have a look at our answers. Uh, we want to, in the end, increase the resistance. So uh, option A doesn't work because you have to increase the length. Option B works for the length but doesn't work for temperature c works because decreasing the thickness gives you a bigger resistance and the increase in temperature gives you a bigger resistance and then in this bottom one they are both uh, going to cause the resistance to decrease so it's clearly option c the diagram shows a circuit containing a dc power supply a motor and a variable resistor Three ammeters show the current in different parts of the circuit. So that's X, Y, and Z. The reading on X is four. Which statement is correct? Well, this is a series circuit, so current is the same everywhere. So if it's four at X, it's four at Y, and it's four at Z. So that's going to be option B. The lamp is connected to a circuit, so the potential difference across it can be varied from zero to six volts. Which circuit would be most suitable? So we're looking for one which would allow the potential difference to change. So we can eliminate option A because the potential difference across this light bulb is always going to be six volts. They're changing this um, variable resistor might well change the current going through your light bulb, but it's not going to have any effect on the potential difference because they're in parallel. And we can do the same thing for option C and options D. In all of them, the light bulb is directly connected to our power supply, so it's always going to have six volts of potential difference across it. So by process of elimination, it must be option B. And you can see that here we haven't got the light bulb directly connected to the power supply. It's essentially connected to this resistor. So what is happening here is where we have the sliding contact essentially divides this into two resistors. So we formed what we'd call a potential divider, two resistors in series with each other. And depending on where the slider is, we change the size of these two resistors. And so we change the potential difference across each of those two resistors. So that one does give us what we're looking for. 
which logic gate is represented by the symbol shown? That is an AND gate. You just have to know that. Uh, this next one here is an OR gate followed by a NOT gate. So we get a NOR gate. An alternating current power supply is connected in series with a resistor and a diode. Which graph shows how the voltage across the resistor varies with time? So this is what we'd call a half wave rectifier circuit. I'm just going to write that on. That You don't have to necessarily know what that's called. There is another circuit called a full wave rectifier um, that can produce a different graph, uh, but we're just going to focus on the half wave rectifier. So what a diode does is it only allows current to travel in one direction. So I'm going to say it doesn't allow negative currents here. So first of all, if we look at our graphs, we can eliminate two of our options because A and D both have negative potential differences, which would give you a negative current. So A and D cannot possibly be right. The other one we can eliminate is B because essentially what this one diode on its own will just chop off negative. It won't replace it with anything. It will just chop it off. So we shouldn't have these sections in here. So our power supply is providing us with a, you know, a constant positive and negative. But essentially what's happening is these, I drew this really badly, but essentially we're going to chop off all of these negative sections, which should have all been identical to one another, but it doesn't matter. So we're essentially looking for a graph without those negative sections, which you can clearly see is option C. Uh, incidentally, option B is what a full wave rectifier will produce. Uh, so that does allow um, us to make use of the negative one, um, but the option this way is C. Electric heater is plugged into the mains using a fused plug. The current in the heater is 10 amps. The cable attached to the heater is rated at 12, 15 amps, which means we need to make sure the current doesn't go above 15 amps in that wire, or even close to it, really. We have fuses available at 1, 3, 5, and 13. Which fuse should be used? Well, it's going to be this 13 amp one, because if we used 1, 3, or 5, we'd never be able to power the heater because it draws 10 amps, so it would just blow the fuse straight away. The 13 amp allows the 10 amp to flow, and it doesn't go over the 15, so that's exactly what we're looking for. What's the purpose of a commutator in a DC electric motor? Uh, it's to reverse the current direction every half turn. So let's have a look at our options. That's C. Uh, all of the others are nothing to do with the commutator of them. OK, so looking at question 37, let's give me a quick different color here. So we've got a diagram showing a wire between two magnetic poles. The wire is in a complete circuit with an ammeter, which you can see here. The wire is moved downwards towards the bottom of the page. A current is induced in the wire. In which direction is the force on the wire caused by this current? So there's two ways of approaching this one. One first way you can use Lenz's law, which tells you a current is induced in a direction such to oppose the motion that created it. So we're moving the wire downward, so it's going to experience a force upward because that's how we oppose that motion. So it's a force towards the top of the page. That's one way of doing this. The other way of doing this is using Fleming's right and left hand rules. So we're inducing a current. So that tells us we're going to be using Fleming's right hand rule. So the field goes from north to south. So with our right hand, our first finger points from north to south. We are moving the wire downward, so our thumb points downward. So you can see that my, your middle finger should be pointing back towards you. So that's going to induce an anti-clockwise current because the current is going to go in this direction here, and then it's going to go around in this direction. So it's going to go anti-clockwise around the wire. So that's the induced current. Now what we've got is a, a wire with a current in it inside a magnetic field. So we're going to get a force on that wire due to the interaction of their two magnetic fields. So now we have to use Fleming's left hand rule. So your first finger points from north to south. Your middle falling finger points in the direction of that current. So you should see that your thumb is pointing upwards. So there's going to be a force in this direction. And it is indeed upwards as Lenz's law said it should be. So the chemical symbol for sodium is Na. The equation represents the radioactive decay of sodium 24. So uh, during 
this kind of decay, we're producing electrons, so this is beta decay. So proton number increases by one. An electron doesn't have a mass number because it's not made of protons or neutrons, so its mass is negligible. So we're looking for x is 12 and y is 0, which is option C. So a radioactive source emits alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays into a vacuum where there is a magnetic field. Magnetic field acts perpendicular to the plane of the paper. So it's going into the plane of paper. So we've got charges moving in a magnetic field. So we're thinking using Fleming's left-hand rule. So your first finger goes into the plane of the page. And then if we have a positive charge going in the direction that they all are to start with, so my middle finger points towards Y, we can see that positive particles will bend left because that's where your thumb is pointing, which means negative ones are going to bend right. So which radiation follows path X, Y, and Z? So alpha are going to go left because they're positive. Beta are going to go right because they're negative. So Z must be beta, X must be alpha, and Y must be gamma. So we can see that that is option B. There. There's, been a, there's a mistake in all of the other ones. Final question. A student measures the level of radiation emitted from a radioactive substance. He places a detector very close to the substance. He puts different absorbers between the radioactive substance and the detector. The student's results are shown. The results are corrected for background radiation. So, we can, so with no absorber, we've got 95 counts per minute from the source, not including background. If we put paper between the source and the detector, you can see the count rate drops. And what that tells us is some of the radiation is alpha because the, it's dropped and it's dropped by quite a lot. If we replace the paper with aluminium, it doesn't change. And that tells me there is no beta involved. If there had been a beta, it, this would have dropped. And then if we put lead in there, you can see it does drop, which means there is some gamma. So essentially we've got some alpha and some gamma, uh, but no beta. So that gives us option B, and that completes this paper. Okay, so I just want to um, finish off by taking a look at a couple of things. I'm going to take a look at the uh, grade thresholds for this paper and also the examiner's report for this paper. So uh, this multiple choice, we were looking at component 2.1, that was the paper we're taking a look at. So you can see that essentially the score that you need to get to achieve the various different grades as part of this paper. As you can see, to get a 9, it's fairly challenging, although this represents what sort of high 70s percent uh, in there, and so you can see what you need to get each of the other ones. Show you is the what you can get from the examiner's report from papers, which is really good to have a look at, because what they'll tell you is which questions people generally found easy and which ones they generally found hard. And if you're aiming for an 8 or a 9, equivalent to an old A star, you need to go back and make sure you can do all of these more challenging ones, because that's how you're going to separate yourself out in the real thing, by being able to do those more challenging questions. So let's take a look at 9, 10, 16, 20, and 23. Uh, so question nine was the rebounding ball one. So it was going downwards at eight and it rebounds upwards at 10. And uh, only the strongest ca uh, candidates realized that the change in velocity was 18, not two, because they had to think of velocity as a vector. Question 10 was the conservation of energy one, where we dropped an object and allowed it to fall 25 meters and applied conservation of energy. Again, uh, only the strongest candidates are identifying that that's a conservation of energy question and then applying it correctly. And for the final three questions, um, the 16 was using ice to cool down water. And it tells you here that it, most people gave the answer that showing that they forgot that there was still 18 grams of ice left at the end. That's the most common error. Question 20 was about the wave fronts uh, causing diffraction, and it shows you the exam board thinks that people selected the one that gives the largest diffraction, not the one that gives the least, uh, possibly indicating that they were, didn't read the question correctly or had only ever learned which one gives you maximum diffraction, hadn't actually learned which one also gives you the least and the conditions of diffraction.
And then finally, uh, this one is about the eclipse of the sun asking you which of the wavelengths is going to disappear first. And the reason they think people are getting this wrong is that, uh, that in a vacuum, all wavelengths travel at the same speed. So uh, when the wavelengths get blocked out, they will all be blocked out at exactly the same time on Earth because they all take, travel at the same speed to get to us. It's only in other materials like water or glass that wavelengths travel at different speeds. And that's why they think people got that one wrong there. OK, so that wraps up this video. Um, just a nice thing to have a look at. If you are doing past papers and doing practice, always have a look at the examiner's report. And if you're going for those eight or nines, always take a look at those most challenging ones and make sure you understand them. And if you don't, go find your teacher and ask them. Um, that's the right thing to do at this stage.